One of the most difficult questions to understand about our origins is this. How can life come from non-life? Since every painting must have a painter, how can anything so well organized spontaneously arrive from an early earth that was so disorganized? Well, it's a good question. And let's start by asking why paintings can't paint themselves. Simple, because they're made of chemicals that can't replicate themselves. Same goes for watches or books or whatever other non-living object you care to mention. Animals and plants, however, are made of chemicals that can replicate themselves. There's no magic involved, it's just basic chemistry that's very well understood. So the real question is, how did these replicating chemicals come about? To answer that question, we need to go through a series of steps. If it's impossible for these chemicals to arise naturally, then let's see which of these steps is impossible. The first step involves looking at the primordial Earth 3.7 billion years ago. There it is, mostly wet, very warm, and with an atmosphere composed of all sorts of gases. Hydrogen, hydrogen cyanide, methane and ammonia among them. DNA is a long chain molecule made from just four different types of nucleotide. So the first question is, where did the nucleotides come from? In 1961, a researcher called Juan Oro left hydrogen cyanide and ammonia to stew in an aqueous solution in his laboratory under conditions very similar to those that prevailed on the primordial Earth. Left alone, the solution produced adenine, one of the four nucleotide bases that make up DNA. To make a complete nucleotide, these bases need to gain a sugar called ribose and a group of phosphates. Biochemists think they know how the phosphate group formed. They're now trying to find out how the ribose is attached. Once nucleotides formed, the next step was to join together to make chains called polynucleotides. In the 1980s, researchers found that a clay called montmorillonite, which was abundant on the primordial sea floor and in hot pools of water on land, is the perfect catalyst for this process. Some of these long polynucleotide chains, like ribonucleic acid, or RNA, are able to make copies of themselves. The copies aren't always perfect. Mistakes creep in. But some imperfectly copied molecules would have been better adapted to the environment than others. These successful molecules continued to replicate and pass on their traits, while weaker or less well-adapted molecules would have broken apart. As RNA molecules replicated themselves, they shared their environment with other chemicals that thrive in Montmorillonite clay. One group, called lipids, have a natural tendency to clump together to form spherical structures called micelles. RNA molecules that attracted these lipids would therefore find themselves protected inside a micelle membrane. Because they were better protected, they better survived and replicated more successfully. There you have the first primitive cells. They look nothing like the complex cells we have today for a very good reason. Over 3.7 billion years, they've evolved. I'll tackle the subject of evolution in another video. Over hundreds of millions of years, RNA grew more complex. The single strand became a double strand, and the better adapted DNA molecule evolved. One of the differences between RNA and DNA is that DNA needs proteins to replicate itself. Proteins are made of amino acids, which are often called the building blocks of life. So where did the first ones come from? A number of experiments using Montmorillonite have produced not only amino acids, but long chains of amino acids called polypeptides. Montmorillonite, it turns out, is a natural breeding ground for all kinds of complex organic chemicals. It has to be said that this research is in its infancy, and current hypotheses are nowhere near as solid as the theory of evolution, which has been around for 150 years and has overwhelming evidence to support it but the reality is a far cry from the idea that scientists believe life popped out of nowhere. Before I go, I just want to rebut a couple of hoary old myths that are often used to show that these steps must somehow be impossible. Really? But we know that's nonsense. Left alone, organic chemicals can and do polymerize to form longer, more complex chemicals. No, it doesn't. The natural origin of life doesn't violate any of the laws of thermodynamics. People who make that claim just need to read the laws of thermodynamics, and they'd see why. That's true, but neither has lightning if we want to be strict about recreating things through natural conditions. For a long time, nuclear fusion couldn't be recreated in a laboratory, even though scientists knew exactly how it happened in nature. 
Recreating something in a laboratory has never been a prerequisite to understanding how it happens. Nature had millions of years and a laboratory the size of the Earth to create just a few molecules that could replicate themselves. Given those odds, scientists aren't even trying to recreate life in a laboratory through natural means. What they are trying to do is find out how these primordial chemicals work, what they're made of, how they interact, and what sort of processes are needed for their natural formation. Biochemists have made huge advances over the last few years, and it's only a matter of time, perhaps easily within your lifetime, that all the steps that make up this process will be understood.